Hey guys, I'm Crystal and welcome to ERCF Online Services. We're so glad you could join us this morning, whether you're tuning in from your couch or your car or haven't quite managed to roll out of bed yet, there is zero judgment here. We're just happy to have you. Make sure to connect with us before our Sunday services on our community group Facebook page and after the service here on our main Facebook page. Well, grab a cup of joe, whatever you need, get comfortable, and let's worship together. The head that once was crowned with thorns Is crowned with glory now The Savior knelt to wash our feet Now at His feet we Shines for all to see. Your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. Your name, your name is victory. No praise will rise to Christ our King. The fear that held us now gives way to Him who our peace his final breath upon the cross is now alive in me your name your name is victory and all praise will rise to Christ our King. Your name, your name is victory. And all praise will rise 
to Christ our King. Yeah. And by your Spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. By your Spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. Yeah. 
Hi, I just want to take this chance to say thank you to our leadership team at Elora Road Christian Fellowship and at the school for all the hard work that they've done during this difficult time in keeping the ministry going and uh, making all the changes that they've had to make. Thank you very much to everyone who's been involved in that. I'm not going to list anyone because I'll forget someone, but there's been a lot of people who have put a lot of hard work into making the changes needed. Let's just keep on worshiping God during this hard time. Worship Him however you can, if that is by singing, if that is by reaching out to someone, if that is by giving, please keep on doing all that. As a board, we are watching the finances closely. Thank you to those of you who are faithfully continuing to give, and please keep on as the Lord asks you to do that. We will get through this. Thank you so much for inviting us into your homes today. It's in the times of our greatest difficulties, times like we're living in right now, that many people react to the storms of life that come around them, the, the emotional trauma, the pain, the inconveniences, the uncertainty, and people respond by Asking themselves the question, of, Where, where's God in all of this? Does God love me? Does God care? And if you have entertaining thoughts like that, if you are wondering those same kinds of questions, then you're not alone. I think all of us wrestle with those thoughts at different times. But we think that no one should have to go through a storm alone. So no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, whether you're a Jesus follower or perhaps you're a seeker or a skeptic or agnostic or you're, you're just wondering and checking things out, we love to come alongside of you and walk together through the storms that you may be facing because we were never meant to walk alone. When I think about the storms that we're in right now, figuratively speaking, of course, the pandemic that's impacting everyone in the world. Personally, I don't think that God is the originator of the pandemic. I don't think he started it. I don't believe that it's a punishment or a judgment from God. What I do believe, though, is that God is using this to shake the world. And as a matter of fact, if you think about our culture, certainly Western civilization, in preceding generations leading up to where we are right now, we have never experienced the kind of prosperity and freedom and independence in the history of the world that we're experiencing in these times in which we lived. In fact, the the cultural expectations that we have as a society and, and personally uh, so entrenched in uh, the idea of self-determination and my own rights and freedoms and the control over my choices and free will. And that's all a part of our culture and who we are. And those very things are being shaken right now. If you weren't here last week when we started our series on stormproofing your life, uh, you really need to go and check last week's installment called Invisible. I know a lot of you are binge watching Netflix and it would be a little bit like starting a, a new show and going to season two right away. You wouldn't do that, same thing. You need to go back to last week, uh, check it out on YouTube or ERCF. A website or Facebook page. Last week when we started, we 
revolved our talk in the whole series around a parable that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 7 about the wise man who built his house on the rock and a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And what we discovered was that the storms reveal the foundation that your house is built on. Nothing like a storm to show us what our life is made of. We also discovered that the real problems in life aren't the storms. And so the real solutions aren't the removal of the storms. The real problem is a bad foundation. And the real solution is to apply the words and teaching of Jesus to our lives. What we learned last week led us to two applications. Uh, the first is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And there the Apostle Paul says to the Jesus followers, let every one of you examine himself to see if he's in the faith. In other words, because following Jesus is not about knowing things, it's about doing, it's about applying things. Paul writes here in this chapter and he says, you need to reflect, you need to stop, put your life on pause for a moment, look inside and ask yourself the question, am I really trusting in Jesus right now? Am I really doing the things that he wants me to do? The second uh, action step that it led us to was found again by the Apostle Paul's writing in Philippians chapter 2, where he says, God is already at work in us, and he's giving you the desire and the power to do his will. So the second step is now praying in concert with what God's doing. God, give me more desire and power to do your will. Lest we fall into this this, uh, this wrong idea, sort of like the hamster wheel treadmill idea that if we work harder and try harder, we'll get the answer that we need. It's not our efforts. It's being open for God to work in us and to give us his divine power and desire. We call that his grace at work in us. For today, the next installment, uh, we're calling this scandalous concept. We're calling it slander. Slander is when we misrepresent another person's character. And in this case, it's God's character. The storm story that we're basing today's talk on is found in Mark chapter 4. We have to remember it's, it's pretty near to the beginning of Jesus' first, uh, first year of ministry. It's, it's close to the beginning of the disciples getting to know Jesus. And so they're all on a boat, presumably in the middle of a big lake. And in Mark chapter 4, the story takes up around verse 27. And there we find that this huge storm arises. The winds are blowing. The waves are breaking over the boat to the point where the boat is already being swamped. And the Bible says the disciples are terrified. Jesus, on the other hand, is asleep in the stern of the boat on the cushion. And the disciples wake him up and say, Jesus, teacher, don't you care? We're going to die. So I, I'd love to have seen that. I wish they'd capture that on video. Did Jesus rub his eye? We don't know if he rubbed his eye. We don't know anything except he stands up, he rebukes the wind, he commands the sea to be still and silent. And then this great calm comes over everything. Jesus says to his disciples, why are you afraid? Why don't you have any faith? Well, at this point, the terror changes. They were terrified they're going to die. And now it says they were terrified and said to one another, who is this man that even the seas and the winds obey him? If you're like me, uh, I've never been out in an ocean or in the middle of a lake on a little boat thinking that it's going to capsize, I'm going to die in the storm. Never been there. So maybe we could be a little judgmental on the question that the disciples asked. Jesus, don't you care? 
maybe we have to change our perspective a bit and think, what about the storms that you've been in? What about the storms I've been in or people close to us have been in? What about the kinds of storms that come and the circumstances swirl around you and you feel like you're going to drown? What about when your wife or your husband or one of your children are being rushed by ambulance to the hospital because there's a, a medical emergency and their life is in danger? What about if you're a business owner and all that you've worked for all of your life has crashed down in front of you and you are bankrupt and you have no idea how to pick yourself up? What if you've just discovered that your child has been sexually assaulted? What if you get a phone call telling you that you've been fired from your job and you have no idea what the future holds? What if the storm that comes to you is caused by the fact that you just discover that your spouse is cheating on you and has been having an affair? And now the circumstances are swirling around and you feel like you are drowning. At those times, Maybe we can understand a little bit better what the disciples are feeling. Jesus, don't you care? In fact, I'd say that the kinds of storms that we're talking about when they come to us, they, they actually solicit bigger questions. And maybe the biggest of all might be this question. If God is real and a God of love, how could he allow suffering in the world? kind of question that brings God's very existence into view or, or his character. How can you say you love us with all the suffering around us? Those kinds of big existential sorts of questions that doubt his existence and bring our very purpose of life into mind. Oh, those are huge questions. And they all reflect on God's character. How could you let that happen? But before we look at, at that question, there's a fundamental thought that we have to grapple with. And that is this idea of God's original intention to love us and our free will and our choice to receive it or to reject it. God cannot make you love him. You can't make anyone love you. I recently saw Phantom of the Opera. It would have been a lot shorter if the Phantom would have figured that out near the beginning of the whole production. You can't make anybody love you. So God decided to love you and me and all of mankind. And now we have choice. We have free will. We don't have to love him. It's our choice. We could love him. We can reject him. In introducing love with the intention of loving us, God injected into this whole dynamic, this equation, this scary concept of risk. As soon as he gives us choice and free will, risk is present and God is risking the fact that his love could be rejected. In fact, I can only reject God's love. I could, I could walk away and do evil. I, I could make wrong choices instead. And in doing that, I'll suffer the consequences of my choices. Life is filled with choices. All of my choices have consequences. And so if I make a wrong choice or even an evil choice, I'll get bad consequences. The consequences that come, God's not punishing me. It's not a judgment against me. It's a consequence of my own actions. And my goodness, that means that my free will and my choice would permit me to take actions and make choices and exert my free will that may be terribly wrong and not only cause wrong and, and terrible consequences that come cascading back to me, my choices may in fact cause 
terrible collateral damage to other people that have nothing to do with my choice. Free will choice is necessary for love, but it runs the risk of victims to my bad choices. Frank Turek, a Christian apologist, said something I heard just last week that I think brings it all into focus. And he says this, he says, God is responsible for the facts of free will, but mankind is responsible for the acts of free will. And we, we need to see the difference. We need to understand the distinction. I'll say it again. God is responsible for the facts of free will, but mankind is responsible for the acts of free will. And if we don't understand the distinctions, we'll misunderstand God's intention. Unless we realize what's going on with free will, we'll end up blaming God's character that he doesn't love us enough, he doesn't care, where in fact, we are suffering consequences of our own actions. So that perhaps allows us a better framework for dealing with this huge question. Does God love us at all? How can he be a good God and allow suffering in the world? In view of all of this, God did not send us an answer to the question. He sent us a person. He sent his son, Jesus. I love how in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, the writer writing to this Hebrew church, Hebrews were Jewish people. Their ancestry is Jewish. And they had become Jesus followers. They had accepted Christ as their savior, their Messiah. And so the writer is now writing to them with that framework also having the same Jewish ancestry, and begins in chapter one, the first three verses, uh, talking like this. God spoke throughout all of history to our ancestors by the prophets in many different ways. The revelation he gave them was only a fragment at a time, building one truth upon another. But to us who live in these last days, God speaks openly through the language of his son, who he appointed the heir of everything. Because through him, through Jesus, God created the panorama of all things in all time. And Jesus is the dazzling rendition of God's splendor. He is the exact expression of God's true nature and character. He is the mirror image. So in other words, Jesus came and revealed who God is like. For the Jewish people who looked at the Hebrew Bible, our Old Testament, and they looked back and looked for God's character, it was revealed in the Old Testament but it's kind of like a mosaic of fragments of revelation that are cobbled together, so to speak, one built upon the other. And so when we're looking for God's character, if we have eyes to see through the person of Jesus, yes, we can see it. But otherwise, it's kind of, it's kind of vague. It's kind of shadowy. It's a little bit cloudy to us. But then we step into the New Testament and it's like stepping into the brilliant sun of a bright noon day. And Jesus reveals brilliantly the character of God. It's, it's in him. He's, the, he's a mirror image of God's true nature, God's character. And so Jesus came to reveal God's character. He came of his own free will by his own choice to die for us. Yes, he was born a baby, but it was in Golgotha. It was actually the night before in Gethsemane that Jesus confirmed for the last time his intention. I am going 
to die for humanity. And he did that on Calvary, Golgotha. Jesus died. Jesus loved you. And so he came to die for you in your place. He took your sin upon his shoulders. He took the, all of the, the, the terrible things that your sin were, were bringing and he brought it to himself. And he died for you because he loved you. He chose to of his own free will. And three days later, the father stamped his approval on his son's perfect sacrifice and raised Jesus from the dead. And that power becomes the fuel for your life and my life today. And so the scripture says, if you've been brought close to God, reconciled because of the death of Jesus, how much more being brought close and reconciled, you will be saved by his life because he's alive. And so we answer, we, we answer the questions that come to our mind when, when the storms are, are blowing all around us and we're surrounded and emotionally we feel like we're going to drown in all of the trouble and all of the pressures that are around us. And the thought comes into our mind, God, do you love me? Do you care, Jesus? We remember Calvary. And we remember that his love was on display and he proved it forever. As an application, when the thoughts of God's character, does he love me through, why does he, why does he let this happen if he's supposed to love me? When those thoughts come, I say to myself, it doesn't matter right now what things look like. It doesn't matter right now what I'm feeling. What matters, I am so loved by God. Jesus loved me and died for me. And of course, he's going to take care of me. The character of God's love becomes a foundation stone that we build our life on. The rock won't move. And so again, when storms come, the thoughts come into your mind, questioning God's character and his love and his care for you, go to Calvary. Say to yourself, like I say to myself, it doesn't matter what things look like right now. It doesn't even matter what I feel like right now. What matters? I am so loved by God. Jesus loved me and he died for me. Of course, he's going to take care of me. And your foundation will stay strong. Just a reminder, if you would like to give, you can do that on our webpage, ercf.ca, by clicking on the donate button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Also, if you have friends or family that aren't on Facebook, our services can also be found on our Allura Road Christian Fellowship YouTube channel. So make sure to check that out. Well guys, thank you for being a part of our Sunday. Make sure to stick around after the service here on our main page to connect with Pastor Murph and Sherry coming right up. God bless and we'll see you next week.